Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks to everyone for coming to the event. We are Sunday to enjoy science in the we thank you all for coming back. We also thank you 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 for coming uh, public outreach event, we will do with better than what we right now. And before we start, there are a few announcements that we need to make. Uh, please switch off your cell phones so that they don't ring and interrupt others during the talk. Uh, please uh, do not bring any edibles or eatables uh, in the auditorium. And uh, we would highly encourage for everyone to Ask the questions, the what are the questions you have after the talk is done, rather than in between the talk, uh, for the benefit of all of you. Um, I'm Sneha Aigre, and I now hand over to Saranyu to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you. Uh, second, yeah, one sec. Hi, I'm Sharanya, and it's a pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Jairam Changaluru. He is a radio astronomer who has been associated with the Jai Meter Wave Radio Telescope since 1996. The GMRT, for short, is located in Khodad near Nasik, so not that far away from here, and you can see a picture right there. Uh, he's interested in techniques of radio astronomy and... Uh, he's interested in techniques of radio astronomy and... Uh, about uh, galactic evolution. Today, he'll be talking to us about listening to the universe uh, with the giant meter wave radio telescope. And of course, I forgot to mention that he's the current director of TIFR and he joined us in July of last year. So over to you, Jaira. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Sharon Yu and Sneha. And um, as Sneha said, I hope you've been, you've enjoyed the day. Um, you know, that was certainly our intention when we put up the science day that we put up something that people would enjoy. So I hope that you all have enjoyed it. And as Neha said, if there's something that we could do better, please do let us know. Um, you know, we are doing it for you all. So it's very important to hear back from you all. So please do let us know if there's something you think we could do better. And we'll certainly try and do that the next time. So um, today I'm going to talk about, um, you know, as advertised, listening um, uh, to the universe with uh, the world's, with, with the giant meter wave radio telescope. And I put listening uh, in quotes because actually we won't listen, listen. I'll actually show you um, visuals. I, I, I had hoped actually to have at least one audio clip to show you all. I wasn't able to do it. So I'm sorry, there'll be no listening. There'll only be seeing, but I still hope it's going to be a fun, for, you know, yeah, a fun journey. So uh, let me just start with an example of the kind of things uh, that, you know, you study, the kind of things that you look at using radio telescopes, such as this telescope, which, as Sharon, you told you, is located in Khodad uh, between Pune and Nasik. And so here I'm showing you um, the end products. Maybe actually even the spotlight's not needed. It could be off so that, yeah. Sorry? Oh, okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> No, uh, you know, no, no, no issues. Uh, maybe the spotlight also could be off so that the screen is, uh, you know, we see only the screen. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, all right, so here I'm showing you, um, you know, the end products of, 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 of evolution. So when you have a star which is several times more massive than our own sun, what happens at the end of its life is that it explodes as a supernovae. And I'm showing you two of the end products of that explosion, which is what you could observe using radio telescopes. So one of them is this kind of spherical shell of material, which is the outer exploded part of the star. Uh, you know, it's hot, it's a hot ionized plasma and that emits radio waves. And you could actually make pictures of it, like this picture, which was made with the GMRT. And so that's the outer part of the dead star, which forms the supernova remnant. And right at the center, what happens is that the material gets into a very compact object, which I'll tell you more about, which is rotating with a very strong magnetic field. And it shoots out this beam uh, of, uh, of radio waves. 
toes, you know, it keeps turning around. And so every time it's pointing towards you, you see a pulse emission like this, right? So, you know, I just wanted to start with this to give you an idea of the kind of things that uh, radio telescopes look at. But, um, you know, what I'd like to do now is to just step back a little bit, ask us the question, what are these radio waves that we are, you know, detecting with our radio telescope? So radio waves basically are electromagnetic waves. Waves are things which transport energy from one point to another. So radio waves basically transport, uh, which, which are electromagnetic waves. They transport electromagnetic energy in the form of oscillating electric magnetic fields, which is what's being shown over here. You have a magnetic field, which is oscillating, an associated electric field, which is also oscillating. And the distance between two successive peaks is what you would call the wavelength, right? Um, you know, depending on wavelength of the electromagnetic waves, people give them different names. So at the very, very short wavelengths, you know, with sizes comparable to that of an atomic nucleus, you have uh, basically gamma rays, right? And on the other end of the spectrum, where you're talking about waves which are very big, waves which could be as big as buildings are tall, you have what are uh, basically radio waves. And radio waves actually span a whole, a whole range of things from wavelengths of the size of butterflies to wavelengths the size of big buildings, right? And um, the energy uh, obtained in one of these things uh, depends on the wavelength. So these very, very short wavelength uh, rays, um, the gamma rays are extremely energetic. And in fact, they could be very harmful for life. Whereas on the other end of the spectrum, these long waves, these radio waves actually have very, very little energy. And those are the things which we are going to try and detect with our radio telescopes. And, you know, as an aside, I thought, it's, uh, you know, since uh, uh, there is, I thought it's worth pointing out that there's actually been a very, very long history uh, of radio communication in India. In fact, the inf invention of radio communication, uh, you know, um, uh, Sir Jay Rose played a very, very large role in that. He was a pioneer in developing radio communication using radio waves. Uh, so the very first public demonstration which he did was in Calcutta in 1895, where he actually communicated using radio waves which he generated and detected using this equipment. In fact, that's you know, a reproduction, reproduction of the original equipment that he had used for his experiment. And he did everything, um, generating the waves, transmitting the waves, detecting the waves, all of that. And he did that in 1895. And you know, it's also interesting that his instrumentation used these crystals, these Galena crystals, which are basically a semiconductor. And it's one of the very first uses of semiconductor for radio instrumentation. So in many ways, Sir Bose was decades ahead of his time. All of this stuff caught up in radio, in mainstream radio, you know, literally, you know, 40, 50 years after his first experiments. All right, but that was just an aside. Let me just go back to talking about waves and radio waves. And I'll tell you a little bit more uh, about the kind of sources uh, that we study using the radio telescope, like the giant meter wave radio telescope. So this one, which I showed you before, this uh, rotating object, which is left at the center, uh, 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 you know, when a star explodes the supernova, uh, is called a pulsar. And it's a very interesting object. Its density is very large. It's the density comparable to the density of a new of an atom. It's a very compact, very dense thing, but it's very massive. Its mass is comparable to that of the sun. And in addition, it's rotating very fast. It's rotating many hundreds of times per second, which is, you know, comparable to the speeds of a mixie that you will use in your kitchen. So you have this very massive, very dense object, which is rotating very fast. And uh, as I said, it has shoots out these beams and that happens because it has a very strong magnetic field in addition to everything else. And the radio waves that it emits come along the north and south pole of that magnetic uh, field uh, associated with the star. So it gets beamed only along those two poles. And as because the star is rotating, every time it points at you, you get a flash of radio waves and otherwise you get nothing, right? And it's a very periodic signal. And I'll talk to you more about what you could do with periodic signal a little later. So that's one example uh, of what uh, you detect using radio waves. Um, this is another example over here. Again, uh, this is an uh, image made with uh, the GMRT. I'm showing you two colors over here, right? There's a bluish color and in the middle there's this dish thing. So the white is what has been obtained using uh, an ordinary telescope, an optical telescope. And that shows you where the stars are. And this is a galaxy. It's a galaxy external to our own galaxy. And so what you see is that this, this is where the stars are. It's a very small bit 
uh, right at the center. And the blue is what you have detected using radio waves. And what, it, what it's showing is where the gas, the, and in this particular case, it is hydrogen gas, atomic hydrogen, which is the most abundant element in the universe. It's showing you where the gas in the galaxy is, right? And it's showing you that if I were, for example, to study this galaxy only using our ordinary telescopes, the optical telescopes, I would completely misunderstand what this object is. I would think there's this collection of stars and this is the size of the galaxy. I'll miss completely that actually there's also a huge amount of gas and the galaxy is much bigger than I might have earlier imagined, right? So uh, th there are things that you see with radio telescopes, which you cannot see uh, with other telescopes because this thing emits radio waves and it does emit light waves. So you can't see it in an optical telescope. The next one's also an example of a similar kind of thing. Uh, right at the center over here, uh, there is a galaxy. And they've zoomed in over there to show you that galaxy. Is that little red dot over there, right? But the source of all of the things that we are seeing over here in the orange, which is radio waves, is not actually the whole galaxy. Right at the center of that dot, uh, of that kind of reddish dot that you see, there's a supermassive black hole, uh, a black hole with a mass of maybe a million times the mass of the sun. And every now and then some material will fall into the black hole and it will swirl and spiral into the black hole. And as it does so, it gets very hot and there are very strange things which, uh, which happen as it swirls in. And one of the things that could happen is that it can shoot out jets of material perpendicular to the, to the swirling in disk. And they're very energetic. They'll be moving at speeds comparable to the speed of light. And you can't even see those jets because they're very fine jets of material which are shooting out on both sides. What you are seeing is when the, when the jet of material actually begins to hit uh, you know, the diffuse stuff in the interstellar medium, in the intergalactic medium, it begins to slow down and it kind of spreads out. <laughs> and that's what you're seeing. You're seeing this kind of hot plasma, uh, which has been sort of uh, ejected from uh, the supermassive black hole at the center and it's emitting radio waves. And again, to give you a size, this is the size of the optical galaxy and this is the size of the you can see that you know the, the material that the galaxy is spewing out is extending to huge distances compared to the size of the galaxy itself. And that, uh, as I'll tell you later, actually plays a very important role when you begin to try and understand how do galaxies in our universe evolve. The fact that a small like this can actually affect, uh, affect uh, large areas in its surroundings. All right, so let me move on. Uh, so you know there are all these nice things which you could observe, sorry. There are all these nice things which you could observe using a radio telescope if you had one, or at least they emit radio waves. So, you know, conceivably you could detect them. But really what you also additionally need is for those waves to be able to penetrate the Earth's atmosphere and reach the ground. Because then you could ground and you could observe the radio waves, right? And so what this um, uh, plot is showing you <clears throat> is how much of different kinds of waves uh, are able to reach the ground. So when it's 100%, it means all of these waves are blocked, right? And only when it reaches to very small percent, it means that most of the rays uh, are able to reach the ground. So if you look at these very short wavelengths, these gamma rays, X-rays, and all of that, the, you know, the, the atmosphere is, is actually completely opaque. It completely blocks these waves. You can't reach, they don't reach the Earth's surface. Uh, there turn out to be astrophysical objects which emit these um, and uh, if you wanted to detect them, you can't do that using a telescope on the ground. You'll have to launch a satellite, which is, and you can't launch a big satellite and so on and so forth. But of course, all of that has been done. Gamma ray satellites, X-ray satellites have all been launched and you could observe many objects using them. I'm not going to talk about them. I just mentioned that, you know, it's a, a bit of a pain for astronomers uh, that the universe, uh, that the atmosphere is opaque at these wavelengths. But for in general, it's a good thing because these waves, uh, you know, are very energetic and they could be very harmful for life if they actually were able to penetrate and hit the Earth's surface. So we probably wouldn't be here, uh, you know, apart from the fact that we need oxygen to breathe. But apart from all of that, if, you know, if the atmosphere, the ionosphere was not blocking these um, you know, life over here would be very, very different, right? The bits <coughs> uh, where the atmosphere is actually transparent and, and electromagnetic waves can reach the Earth, are, there are basically two major windows. One is this, which is relatively narrow, which is the visible light that you see, the normal spectrum with pure, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, anything in outer space which is emitting light waves, you should be able to observe them on the Earth because the atmosphere is transparent. The other place where it's major, uh, 
where it's transparent is this one, which goes from a wavelength, you know, this very large wavelength range over here. Those are radio waves, right? So, uh, so that, you know, that's a very serendipitous thing about radio waves. That is one of the two wavelength regimes being visible light and the other one being the radio waves where you could actually build up on the ground and detect, you know, uh, emission from outer space. Of course, you need a radio telescope to do that. <clears throat> and that kind of technology begin to, began to appear only uh, in the early uh, uh, 1900s, right? And so the first detection of radio waves from anything outside of the Earth was uh, was done by the Carl Jansky in the 1930s using this antenna, and it was an accidental discovery. So what had happened was in those days, um, uh, radio waves were being used uh, for telegraph for telegraphy for communicating signals, um, you know, from Europe to to the U.S. and so on and so forth. And uh, when you are trying to transmit a signal, it's very important that the signal be transmitted faithfully and very little noise be added to the signal. If what you're receiving is very noisy, then you're not sure uh, you know, whether you've received it correctly or not. So uh, the people who, uh, who, who employed um, um, uh, Karl Jansky were actually people who were in the business uh, of transmitting radio waves and transmitting signals. And they wanted to figure out what are all the sources of noise so that whatever ones they could eliminate, they could try and do that so that they would be able to receive their signal properly. So that was the job he had been given. He had been given the job of taking this antenna and trying to understand what all sources of noise there are. And, and he was a very careful person when he did this experiment. And uh, so one of the things he did, he did it uh, you know, for, for many, many months. And uh, through his careful observations, he realized actually that there's a little bit of the noise that he's receiving, which is not coming from Earth. And um, how he figured that out is a separate story. You can ask me later. Um, but he figured that out, that this bit of noise is not coming from the Earth. In fact, he, he, he pinpointed it to come from the center of our Milky Way galaxy. And it was the first uh, ever detection of radio uh, waves uh, from an extraterrestrial source. Of course, it was a big discovery. All the newspapers covered it and so on and so forth. But actually, none of the astronomers cared. Right? Uh, there was absolutely no astronomy which was done with radio waves for a long, long time. That again is an interesting story. And that's partly because all of the astronomy which had been done up till then was optical astronomy. The technology for optical and the technology for radio are completely different. And it took a long time <clears throat> for these two fields to talk to each other. So, you know, he did this experiment in the 1930s. The newspapers covered it, but the astronomers really didn't care. And for a long, long time, there was only one person who was actually trying to do radio astronomy, and that was an amateur called, called Grote Reber. And he built this telescope in his backyard. And using this telescope in his backyard, he did radio astronomy for about 10, 12 years, and he, he was probably the only person in the world doing radio astronomy in that time. Radio astronomy really took off after the World War. In World War II, what happened was that there was, um, you know, you had aircraft uh, which used to come and bomb the cities. It became important to try and detect the aircraft before it reached near the city. And to do that, uh, everybody began to develop radar systems. And so that's pretty much the same technology as radio astronomy. So there were all of these radar systems which were developed. And after the war, suddenly you had all of these this, all of this surplus equipment. There were a lot of people who understood how to build sensitive radio detectors and so on and so forth. And that really led to uh, you know, an, a, a, a rapid growth of radio astronomy. And uh, to start with, the radio astronomers actually used uh, all the excess equipment which was left over after the war. And in fact, this particular telescope over here was used uh, by a bunch of Dutch astronomers for many years. And it was one of the first telescopes uh, which was able to detect uh, the, the radio waves emitted by the atomic hydrogen in our own galaxy. Um, if I come to TIFR, where we are standing right now, radio astronomy at TIFR also started very, very early. It started in the 1960s. So uh, around the 1950s and so on was when the first bits of radio astronomy began to happen all over the world. And within 10 years, uh, there was also uh, quite a strong group at TIFR. So in the early 60s, um, there were this group of astronomers working abroad in radio astronomy, and they had written to a number of places in India saying that there is this new exciting field. They'd like to return to India. They'd like to start. Uh, research in radio astronomy, but one person responded to them, and that was Dr. Homi Baba. And this is the copy of the telegram that he sent the leader of the group, Professor Gomez Swaroop. 
And he, he responded to their proposal with this telegram saying that he, you know, he's taken a look at it and he would be very happy to support radio astronomy at TIFR. And so in 1963, Govind Swaroop, whose picture I'm showing you over here, moved from Stanford University to TIFR and started the radio astronomy group over here. And it's been sort of going uh, strong ever since. So the first telescope that Swaroop and his team built was actually quite close uh, to where we are sitting. It was in Kalyan. It was called the Kalyan Radio Telescope. And this is, uh, you know, um, the, uh, he and his team putting it together. Uh, and but they very quickly moved on to a much, much bigger telescope. It's called the Uti Radio Telescope located in Uti. And that's the picture I'm showing you over here. It's a massive structure. It's half a kilometer long, 30 meters wide. It's built on a hill slope of 10 degrees for, for, for various technical reasons I won't get into. But as you can imagine, it was a massive engineering challenge. All of this was done in the 1960s, but it was all achieved. And it was one of the most sensitive radio telescopes in it. Used for all kinds of things from studying the universe, studies of the gas between galaxies, studies of pulsars, studies of the gas between the sun and the earth, all kinds of stuff. And it's still uh, being, it's still in use and doing useful work. But, you know, I won't talk a whole lot about it. Uh, instead, what maybe I'll do, I'll talk about the GMRT. And I wanted to start with just giving you a broad idea of how radio telescopes work. So basically, you have, you, you can, uh, you know, you have a mirror. Uh, you, you'll ask me, where is the mirror? Uh, you know, you don't seem to be able to see a mirror. The mirror is actually there. The mirror is a fine mesh of wire. And because the wave, wavelength of the waves that we are uh, receiving is so large, it doesn't matter that there are holes between the wires. The way, you know, the radio, as far as the radio wave is concerned, it's a solid surface because the holes are much, much smaller than the wavelength. So the, the radio waves come in here. And as far as the radio is concerned, this is a solid mirror. So it comes and hits this mirror, which is parabolic in shape, and it goes, gets reflected, and it goes and it goes into the focus over there. At the focus, we have uh, an antenna, which is we call a feed antenna. And what that feed antenna does is it takes all of that electromagnetic energy, which is um, sort of coming in on that radio wave, and it converts it to a voltage. And that voltage is then amplified over here. There are electronics with amplifiers and so on and so forth. And then it's sent down along one of these legs in a cable. It goes down here uh, where it's converted into an optical signal and an optical fiber. And it's sent off back uh, to the control for further processing. Uh, of course, you want the antenna to be able to point at any source that you want. So this whole mirror is mounted on a, uh, on a mount, which is able to turn in two axes. It can turn like this to a scan along the horizon. And like my head turns, it can turn up and down. So that allows it to point pretty much everywhere in the sky. Right? So that's basically, uh, you know, uh, how a radio telescope works. I need to tell you something more uh, about these radio telescopes. And basically, this uh, ties with a very fundamental property of waves. Waves act undergo something called diffraction. Now, you, you know about light and light rays, you know that light rays travel in a straight line, but that's not the whole truth. <laughs> and in all rays go this phenomena called diffraction. And I'm showing it to you here for water waves. So what you're having is this is the ocean and there are waves coming in and the waves are coming in parallel to the shore. Just before it reaches the shore, there is this wall uh, which they have constructed to sort of stop the waves. There's a breach in the wall and there's a little bit where you know, the water can actually come in. Now, if it was traveling like light in straight lines, um, you know, what we have been taught, then what you would imagine is that the water would come straight right? Because there are these waves which are coming in this direction, you block a part of the wave, the rest of it will come down. Like that. But that's not what happens. If you look at it, the wave is actually spreading out, right? It's, it's not coming out in straight lines after that, it's sort of spreading out. And that phenomena is called diffraction, and all waves undergo diffraction. And the consequence of that is that the images that you make with a telescope will never be perfectly sharp. You'll take a, so, a star, which is point like, but when you make an image of the star with a telescope, to be blurred. And I bring that to you over here for the Hubble Space Telescope. This is, of course, an amazing picture made with very, very high resolution. And it's about uh, what you're seeing really is uh, clouds of gas which will collapse to form stars. But the thing I want to draw your attention to is this. Yeah, it's a star, which should be like a point, right? But it isn't. You can see that the image of the star actually is smeared out and you have all of these rays shooting out in different directions. 
that has to do with this fundamental property of waves that namely that they undergo diffraction. So because of that, uh, you know, you can see that the star, star's image has got blurred out. So that means supposing I had a second star very near the star, so close that it was within this blurred out region, I would never be able to make out, right? Because it would be too blurred. I can't make out that there are two stars over there instead of one, right? So there's a fundamental limit to the resolution my ability to distinguish fine features, my ability to say whether there are two stars or one star. And that actually depends on two things, this, uh, you know, your resolution, it depends on the wavelength at which you're observing, and it depends on the size of the telescope. And, uh, you know, it depends basically on the ratio of the two. So it means as the wavelength gets smaller and smaller, your resolution will get better and better for a given size telescope. So this is where you begin to have a problem in radio astronomy. And to help you appreciate that, let me just go back to this picture, right? So um, let's see. So it's supposing I had an optical telescope, which works in visible light. Its wavelength is, you know, somewhere, uh, you know, uh, uh, of the order of a few tens of millions of tens of a millionth of a meter, right? It's about 10 to the minus six meters. The radio waves I'm talking about are over here. There are a few meters in size maybe, right? So there's almost a factor of 10 million. The radio waves are about 10 million times longer than the optical waves. And so that means that the images that I make with a radio telescope will be horribly blurred out uh, compared to the image that I make with an optical telescope. So again, I'll show it to you over here. And I'm just comparing, you know, the image that I would make with some amateur telescope like this, something small um, that, you know, amateurs might buy and use, or like the telescopes which we had out front to show you the sunspots. Those things will have resolutions of the order of one arc second. And it turns out on the uh, surface of the Earth, that's about, unless you do something very fancy, that's the best resolution you can get at optical wavelengths because the Earth's atmosphere actually is turbulent and that turbulence actually also causes the stellar star images to jitter. Right, and so because of that, about one arc second is what you get, but and it doesn't uh, depend that much on the diameter of the telescope because it depends more on the turbulence in the atmosphere. So even your, uh, you know, typical sort of uh, amateur telescope will give you about an arc second, whereas you know even the biggest telescope, unless you do something very very fancy, will also give you of that order of one arc second. Now, supposing I compare it with a radio telescope, uh, this one's about 110 meters across. So I have this thing, which is, you know, a few tens of centimeters across. I have this thing, which is 100 uh, meters across. Um, but the wavelength operate are very different. The length at this, op which, which this operates is you know, sort of 10 million times longer than the wavelength at which this operates. And so consequently, the angular resolution I get out of it is actually far, far worse than the angular resolution I'll get out of it. The angular re resolution I'll get out of this would be of the order of arc minutes. So to give you an, you know, an idea of what that means, I've shown you two pictures of the moon, right? So this is a picture which I would get typical optical telescope. I can see all kinds of nice things, right? I can see the craters of the moon. I can see these dark spots called seas and so on and so forth. And this actually, uh, uh, you know, it's not blurred as much as a radio telescope would blur it, it's, but I've blurred it to of the order of an arc minute or so. A radio telescope would actually blur it much more. But, and this is what, you know, it, uh, a radio telescope would see, except is something more blurred than this. So you can see that it's very, very difficult to compare these two, right? You can't see any craters, you can't see anything. You can just maybe about say that I'm seeing a round object and that's about it, right? So um, that actually is a severe drawback and you'd like to do something uh, to, to get around it. So you might, okay, fine, maybe you should build a bigger radio telescope. Don't stop at 100 meters, build something much bigger, build something big enough to get you about an arc second of resolution. But if you stop to think about it, it actually becomes fairly crazy because if you want to do uh, arc second resolution at the wavelengths we are talking about, the mirror you'd have to talk about, I've superposed it on a map of Maharashtra is about this big, right? Here we are sitting in Bombay and you know, Pune is over here. You, you know, this is the size of the telescope that we'd have to build uh, to, to get arc second re resolution in astronomy. And that's obviously, um, you know, a crazy thing to even talk about. Let's say you have to do something different to get high resolution in radio astronomy. And what you do is you use another properties of the wave. And the fact that you use the fact that the waves interact, uh, you know, they don't actually, um, you know, so if I had sources of waves, they would interact with each other. And I'm showing you that picture over here. 
that this is again uh, in a tank of water, you have two sources of waves in the water. And you know, there are these waves coming out and you can see they actually interact with each other. There are spots which are much, much brighter where these two waves are adding up together. And when they don't add up, uh, it's not as bright. So basically um, what happens is that if I have two sets of waves, you know, if, I, if the waves are exactly aligned, you know, one, so one set of waves is like this, the other set of waves is like this, they're both aligned. If I add them up together, I get a much bigger wave. On the other hand, if one wave is like this and the other wave is exactly uh, the opposite, it's misaligned completely. When I add them up, it cancels out, it gets me zero, right? So, uh, so that's the fact the, that we will use to get high angular resolution in radio astronomy. So what we do instead of building one big telescope, We'll take just two small telescopes, but we'll put them a very large distance apart, and we'll combine the reflected waves, right? So if the waves exactly align, I'll get a strong signal. And, um, you know, if they are sort of uh, misaligned, they'll cancel out. So I'm just showing you that, you know, pictorially over here, I have two little mirrors over here. Supposing I had a source, a star, a radio star or whatever, which was vertically overhead, the rays are coming straight down, they reflect and they come over here to a focus. And because of the symmetry of the parts are exactly the same. And so, you know, this wave which came from the left mirror and this wave which came from the right mirror are exactly aligned. If I add them up, I'll get a nice strong wave. On the other hand, if I go, uh, you know, to a source which is a little bit off the axis, then you can see when this ray has hit the mirror, the other ray has to still this extra distance to travel, right? It hasn't yet hit the mirror. So this ray is going to hit the mirror a little later and then it'll get reflected and go and sort of uh, these two will add up together. And because it's, it's got that extra distance to travel, these two waves get slid with respect to one another. And if, you know, uh, and you can see also very clearly that, um, you know, that this extra distance that it has to travel depends completely on the separation between the two mirrors. If the separation was half, uh, you know, it would have to travel half the distance. If the separation was twice, it would have to travel twice the distance and so on, right? So um, uh, the, 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 the further apart I put the mirrors, the more quickly, um, you know, the waves will cancel as I go from vertically overhead. And in fact, you can show that, you know, if I went off an angle just about lambda by small d, where small d is the distance between the two mirrors, waves would no longer add up properly. So that means that now it's like I've made a mirror of size small d as far as the resolution is concerned. Each of my mirrors is very small, but the image that I make has, can see a lot of fine detail because it, it really distinguish between a source which is vertically up and a, which, for which the waves will add up together and a source which is a little bit off from the vertical up where they will sort of get misaligned and not add up. And so that's basically the trick that you use in radio astronomy. It's called radio interferometry. You use an array of antennas to get very high resolution, but you don't get high sensitivity, you know, so um, I should uh, point out you know, supposing I took a radio telescope like this, one of the things which I forgot to tell you, telling you now, is that you can regard it as a bucket. You know, it collects all of the photons, all of the light photons which come in, or the radio wave photons which come in, all of them get reflected and go over there. So it's like a bucket collecting all of the photons and collects it and it sort of puts it into the focus over there, right? So all of the energy which fell on this mirror will finally go and end up over there. <coughs> When I do this trick of radio interferometry, what happens is I collect uh, the radio waves which fall at antenna and so on and so forth. I don't collect the things which fall in between. All of the, uh, all of the uh, radio waves which fall between the antennas are just simply lost. So the only energy I get is the, is, you know, the little bits which fall on these different antennas. So I don't have a very sensitive telescope because I'm not able to collect uh, as many photons as I would have if I had a telescope which was as big uh, as the whole array, but I get a resolution which is set by the size of the whole array. Um, so uh, in radio interferometry, what you do is uh, similarly to what on each antenna, you amplify, you digitize it, and then after that, you combine them suitably electronically to get your big, um, uh, to, get, to get your signal. So it's like making, you know, an image you could imagine using mirror with large holes in it. So basically this is, you have mirrors wherever you have antennas you, and wherever you don't have antennas, it's large, you, you have uh, holes. And the fewer the holes, of course, the better the image that you would make, right? And so there are various tricks you could use to do that for the fire. For example, the fact is that we are sitting on the surface of the earth 
which is rotating in space. So even if I have put the antennas in fixed locations, if I'm looking at it from outer space, those antennas are rotating, right? And so that means as time goes on, I cover more and more of the mirror that I'm trying to make, which is what I was trying to show you in that simplistic uh, simulations over there. And you basically use the fact that what we are trying to measure is some, stat it turns out, some statistical property of the radio source. That's what you need to make these images. And typically these sources are very steady. They don't change uh, for much longer than, you, you know, they change, don't change for times which are much, much longer than the human lifespan. So all of the measurements that I need to make to synthesize this big mirror doesn't have to be made at the same time. I could make some today, I could make some tomorrow, I could make some in 10 years, and I could combine all of them to, to make my final image. And in fact, that's actually quite often done. And as I said, because the antennas move as the earth rotates, it fills up the mirror. So even if I have a relatively small number of antennas, you can actually end up making quite nice images. So that's pretty much what the GMRT does. Uh, this is the telescope built and operated by NCRAT IFR, which, as we said, is located in the neighborhood of Nasik. It's an array of 30 antennas, each 45 meters in diameter. It uses a very novel, cost effective design, which was conceived of uh, by Professor Govind Swaroop. It's a very large array. It's spread over an area of 25 kilometers. So it makes images as though, you know, it was made with a mirror 25 kilometers across. Uh, all of the antennas, as we said, is uh, connected to the central electronics building via optical fiber cable. This design and sort of all of these things were finalized in the mid 80s and the telescope began getting built in the 90s. At the time, uh, this was probably one of the largest orders of optical fiber cable in India because practically nobody else was using optical fibers in those days. That's a, you know, close to 40 years ago. Um, the telescope itself was uh, completed in the late 90s. And so this is just showing you the array configuration. We have a bunch of antennas over here in the middle, and we have the remaining antennas spread out uh, over the countryside in, in, in Kodad and Naranga. And it's operated as an facility and it was declared open uh, to the country by uh, Shri Tata in 2001. Um, so we operate in a, you know, in a kind of open skies mode. That means um, this telescope, uh, we don't care uh, where you're working. Uh, if, you, if you want to use the telescope, what you have to do is you have to write down whatever idea you have, what you want to observe. You write it down and it goes to an international panel for review. And uh, if that panel thinks your idea is good, exciting, and should be done, the time is just given without bothering about which institute or which country you come from. And so uh, typically, uh, we uh, of the order of uh, you know 100 or more projects in a year with people from over 40 countries all over the world. And they were just showing you uh, a pie chart over here showing you which all countries use this telescope uh, with about half of the time being used by astronomers from India. So as far as we are concerned, we all compete with everyone else in the world. If our ideas are good enough, we get the time. If not, we don't. And uh, all of the data that we take right from 2001, uh, we've, it's archived, it's freely available on the web. Uh, people who want to use it for whatever research are free to do that. And in fact, there's a large amount of research which now happens not using data freshly taken with the telescope, but data which we took 20 years ago and which uh, you know, is available on our archive. I also wanted to mention that this telescope uh, has been recognized by the IEEE as a milestone achievement. And, um, you know, out of curiosity or, you know, completeness, I'll also say that this is only the third such um, uh, recognition in India. The first recognition was something which I spoke to you about, which was uh, Sir J.C. Bose's invention of the radio in 1895. The second is C.V. Raman's uh, uh, Nobel Prize winning work. And this is the third um, that, that we have uh, in India uh, as a recognition milestone by the IEEE. It's basically the construction and operation of the GMRT. So I think that's a real tribute to Professor Govind Swaroop, the way he, he and his team uh, sort of got it all implemented, and as well, of course, to all of the staff and engineers at NCRA who sort of kept it going. Uh, it's not just that they have kept it going. Uh, where the telescope has been very significantly uh, upgraded uh, over the last 20 years. And, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 pretty much if you look at it, almost every part of this telescope has been changed uh, since the time it was inaugurated in 1920, because technology keeps changing and you need to keep sort of keeping up with time. Otherwise, you'll very quickly sort of lose the competitive edge. And so, um, as I said, almost everything from the feed antennas that we put at the top to all of the receiving equipment that we use at the end has all of it been changed. And the main thing that this change was that it changed 
the frequencies that we receive. Earlier, we could receive only a narrow range of frequencies at a time, a bandwidth of about 32 megahertz. And now we, we sort of get receive about 400 megahertz at a time. And that makes a huge difference to the sensitivity. And again, to sort of, you know, uh, to give you an analogy, I sort of have this uh, very simplistic idea that I told you that telescopes are like photon buckets. They collect all of the photons which fall in it. And this bandwidth thing that I'm talking about is like the size of the pipe which you use, which will run into your detector or whatever else it is. So earlier we had this very narrow pipe. So there were a lot of photons falling onto our telescope, but we weren't able to get it to our detector. So most of them went waste. Now we have a much broader pipe, a pipe which takes 10 times more um, than, than we were able to go. And that actually allows us to be much, much more sensitive than we were earlier. All right, so now I'm going to um, uh, talk about uh, various things that people do with this telescope and I'll focus more on what we've been doing more recently after the upgrade has been completed. And it's just going to be a whole range of things. There's no uh, very coherent theme over here because the telescope's actually very flexible and can do all kinds of stuff. And I've also more or less randomly chosen things. It's not necessarily that these are, you know, in some sense, the most important things that the telescope has done. So uh, let me start with this. Um, so yeah, I'm talking about uh, radio waves from very massive stars. So massive stars actually are very active. I told you towards the end of their life, they will explode as supernovae, leaving behind a pulsar and so on and so forth. But even before that, they're doing all kinds of things. So for example, they blow up very strong. And I'm showing you over here an optical image made with the Hubble Space Telescope of, a, of this massive star, <laughs> which is the wind. And the star is actually also moving very rapidly. Uh, along that direction. And uh, what is happening over here is that the wind that is blowing out, it's in a cloud of gas. And so the wind that's blowing out is actually slamming into the cloud and you have this very strong shock wave and sitting in front of the star as it moves, right? So that's what you're seeing in the optical. It turns out that these massive stars could also sometimes have very, very strong magnetic fields. And then the interaction between the wind and the magnetic field could actually lead to a, a, a kind of maser emission. So maser is basically exactly the same as laser, excepting laser is the word you use when you're uh, amplifying light waves. Maser is the word you use when you're amplifying microwave rays, waves, which are basically radio waves. So you get this kind of laser effect over here because of this interaction. And you get these very strong sort of radio waves, uh, which, which sort of uh, uh, come out of the star. And you observe them again as pulses because the, you know, the, the radio waves come out in a particular direction, the star is sort of rotating. So only when it's pointing at you, you'll get a pulse of radio waves, right? And so that um, uh, so it sort of uh, allows you to, 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 to for example, uh, infer that it's coming from this rotating star, various properties of the wave, for example, the way it's polarized and so on and so forth, allows you to infer that it's actually a maser. It's a, you know, it's mazed emission, it's not a regular emission. And um, in fact, it turns out that the vast majority of these stars, uh, which are known, have been discovered using the uh, UGMRT, using uh, by, by observations by one of our PhD students, Barnali Das, and her, uh, her, her PhD advisor, Poonam Chandra. All of these people, they over the last sort of five or six years have actually discovered a very large number of these stars. Earlier, there was, I think there was only one of them known. But once you have a sensitive telescope working at the right frequency range, you can actually go out and find a whole lot of them. And that's very interesting because their observations allow you to measure the, the material around the stars. It may, allows you to measure the magnetic field. And all of these things in turn affect the way in which the star will evolve and what will happen to the star later. All right, um, now I'm going to talk to you about things you could do with pulsars. Right, so um, uh, pulsars, I told you, were these very massive neutron stars with a very strong magnetic field. They have the densities like a density of an atomic nucleus. They are rotating with speeds comparable to that of your kitchen mixie. And again, they emit these bright radio waves, which you see as a pulse like this every time uh, the, the, the pulsar is pointing at you. And um, they're very, very accurate clocks. You can actually do very accurate timing uh, using these pulses because the, the, at the time at which the pulse is arriving can be very accurately sort of, and you can, you can say precisely to very high accuracy when the next pulse will come. Right? 
That makes it so you have these very accurate clocks sort of distributed all over space uh, around you. And you would think, okay, fine, that's all right. What are you getting excited about clocks, which you've sort of spread all over space? But it turns out actually you can do fun stuff with them. So it turns out every time you have these gravitational waves, which sort of pass between you and these clocks, they will distort the space between you and the clock. And that means that the light, the, the pulse which was coming to you will actually come either a little sooner or a little later than it should have because the space got distorted. Right. And so that means that using these things, you could actually detect these gravitational waves. Right. So, um, as probably many of you know, gravitational waves were recently discovered, uh, uh, detected, uh, uh, you know, about uh, 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 a few years ago. And that um, uh, uh, sort of was a discovery which got uh, the Nobel Prize. And that was detected uh, using laser, a laser based interferometer located on the surface of the Earth. That it turns out that different objects emit different kinds of, of, of gravitational waves. So those uh, gravitational waves which were detected came from mergers of relatively small black holes, black holes with masses of a few times that of the sun. There are also these very, very massive black holes, black holes with masses a million times that of the sun, right? And uh, when these sort of merge, the, the gravitational waves that you produce are very slow. They're very sort of, you know, long period gravitational waves, which you could not detect with these laser interferometers you could detect them using this, this sort of uh, uh, set of pulsars that you have. So that's sort of, you know, one of the things that you could do if you had um, uh, sort of very accurate clocks distributed in space around you. And in fact, that's a very active program being followed by many radio telescopes across the world. Now, when you do this kind of uh, measurements, you have a problem. And the problem is that the, the, the space uh, between you and the um, pulsar is not a vacuum. It's filled with ionized gas. And so um, it's sort of you know, what the consequence of that is that the pulse actually doesn't reach you as a pulse. Uh, the, the different parts of the pulse reach you at different times. Um, the high frequency parts of the pulse will reach you sort of first and the low frequency parts of the pulse reach you later because you know, the, you're sort of propagating through this medium which is doing funny things. It's smearing out your pulse. So you have to correct for it. And it turns out um, it's possible to correct for it, but you need very accurate observations with a telescope uh, you know, with uh, at low frequencies and high sensitivity, and that's exactly the role that GMRT is playing over here. So you have this large consortium of institutions searching for gravitational waves from supermassive black holes, of which the UGMRT is a part. And its very unique contribution is to actually be uh, uh, allow one to make all of the corrections that you have to make for other things before you would be able to predict exactly when the next pulse uh, would come. All right, I'll move on in interest of time. Um, I'll uh, sort of maybe just talk about two more things. So again, I'm talking about pulsars, right? So you are going to spin this thing up to spin like a kitchen mixie. How do you do that? You know, how do you take a mass, which is many times that of the sun and spin it up, you know, uh, to, to kitchen mixie speeds? This, this animation is showing you how you could do it. Basically, you have two stars. One star has exploded as a supernovae already. Uh, these two stars are in orbit around one another. The more massive one evolves faster. It exploded as a supernovae. And then after that, the second one begins, begins to evolve. And when, the, when stars evolve, they sort of become bigger and puffier. And so as it becomes bigger and puffier, it begins to lose material from its outer parts. And it, that material begins to accrete and fall onto the pulsar, which was originally formed. Right. And so the pulsar begins to accrete material, which is moving very fast because it's coming from another star, which is moving fast around it. And so that material uh, sort of dumps angular momentum onto the star. And so the pulsar begins to uh, rotate faster and faster, spin faster and faster and faster. You can see that in the animation, that as time goes on, the pulsar actually is spinning faster and faster because material which has got high angular momentum is getting dumped onto this uh, pulsar right at the center. Right. So this is the idea. Can we test it? It turns out you can, right? Because what happens when this process goes on is when this material is dumping onto the, uh, getting dumped onto the star, uh, the star becomes very hot. Uh, the pulsar at the center becomes very hot and starts emitting X-rays. 
and the, the accreted material also is very hot, it starts emitting X-rays and you see X-rays. And then because there's all of this material around the star, the radio waves are blocked, right? So what you see when these kind of processes are going on is that, and the process is sporadic, you'll see X-rays emitted for some time. That's when all of this material is getting dumped onto the star. And then when uh, that process switches off for a little while, <clears throat> the, the material clears and you see the pulsar spinning again. Of course, now it is spinning a little faster than it was before, right? And so, um, you know, if you were able to get these, to see these objects, you know, where the material is actually getting dumped onto the pulsar and see it switch, from sort of the phase where it's emitting X-rays because my hot material is falling on it to the phase where the material has sort of got cleared away and it's sort of spinning a little faster, you could actually measure the whole process. And that indeed is the kind of studies, one of the various kinds of studies that you could do uh, with the JMRT. And um, so, there, so I'm showing you examples over here, but I won't actually get into details. I'm going to skip this completely. I'll end with this last thing, uh, where I'm going to talk about radio telescopes as time machines. All telescopes are time machines. So you probably know that light has a finite speed and uh, whatever, 300,000 kilometers per second. And so it means that the light from the sun takes eight minutes to reach the earth. So when I observed the sun, when you looked at the sunspots today, you were not seeing the sunspots as they are now. You were seeing them as they were eight minutes ago. You were actually looking into the past. The nearest star is 4.3 light years away, which means when you are looking at the light from that star sitting on the earth, you're seeing the star as it was 4.3 light years ago. 4.3 years ago, you're seeing it in the past. And the very distant objects that we are looking at uh, uh, could be, you know, tens of billions of uh, light years away, which means that we are seeing them as they were billions of years ago. So you could actually use a telescope and study distant objects. And what you're actually doing is studying the past of the universe, right? And so that allows you sitting over here on Earth, making observations right now to actually look at the universe as it was at different times in the, in the past. You can actually study the evolution of the universe. And um, so that's the last thing I wanted to talk to you about, uh, studying evolution of the universe, uh, study things of, uh, you know, the uh, various ways in which different objects in the universe evolve. And um, what I'm showing you over here is uh, a graph of how stars are formed in the universe. So this is, you know, uh, on the vertical axis, I'm telling you how many stars the universe is forming per unit volume per unit time. And uh, this is uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 the look back time of the universe. So 12 billion years ago, it wasn't forming a great deal of stars. About 10 billion years ago, it's actually forming stars at, you know, quite a, quite a rapid rate. And if you look at it today, it's actually forming stars at a much lower rate than it was 10 billion years ago. Right? And this is uh, things that people have known for a couple of decades. They know that, you know, about 10 billion years ago, the universe was forming stars very rapidly, uh, but whereas now it doesn't form it so rapidly. And the question is why? Right. So one possible reason, we know that stars form out of gas. I showed you, for example, that picture of a star forming region uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope. And so supposing I'd, I run out of gas in the, in the galaxy, I won't be able to form any more stars because I don't have any raw material left for, 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 for the stars to form. Right. So what I'd like to do is then maybe just check how much gas is there over here in the galaxies and how much gas is there in the galaxies over here. Maybe what has happened is that all of the gas has run out and because of that, I can't form any more stars because the gas is just over. Now there's a problem if you want to try and check that because it turns out that this atomic hydrogen, uh, which is the fundamental reservoir, the main gas out of which all of the stars will form, it does emit radio waves, but it's very, very weak. It's very difficult to detect them. Right. And so there's very little known about it until the very, very recent past, until, you know, uh, we began to do very deep observations using the upgraded GMRT. And we are able to actually make these measurements. We are actually able to image the galaxy, the gas in the galaxies or the average sort of amount of gas in a galaxy all that way 10 billion years ago. And we were actually able to measure how much, much gas is there in the star. You could see. At that, that time, they had enough gas to form a whole lot of stars, whereas if you look at the galaxies around you today, the, that gas seems to have run out, and you know there's not enough gas left in these galaxies to form stars at that very rapid rate at which it was forming 10 billion years ago. Right? So we're able to sort of, you know, directly sort of show that this scenario is probably the right one. What is happening is that the galaxies are running out of gas to form stars. 
All right, so that was a little bit of, uh, you know, a catch bag uh, of things that you do with radio telescopes. There are actually all kinds of other things that people do. I haven't, uh, you know, really begun to even scratch the surface of what um, uh, people could do using radio telescopes. I've just put another bunch of stuff over here. I'm not going to walk through it, but, you know, if you're interested, we can talk a little bit about it later. So what I'll do is I'll stop and I'll thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot for the amazing talk. I would uh, now give the stage to Arnab to make some announcements. Uh, okay, so thank you all. You've had a very long day. Thank you for being with us. I hope you've enjoyed the day. I hope you've enjoyed watching the labs, watching the activities outside, and also hearing to, uh, some of these very nice talks. And thank you so much for giving us an introduction to astronomy, radio astronomy, Everybody, especially when I was in school, always thinks astronomers look through telescopes, you know, with their eyes. But no, there's so much more that you can do in the radio, with radio waves. And thank you, Jairam, for telling us all about it. Uh, so we can, uh, we have a little bit of time for question answers. And then before you go, remember this chai outside, so don't miss that as well. Um, and um, um, yeah, so if anybody has questions, we have a few people with mics. Uh, please wait for the mic to come to you and then ask the question. So, uh, yes, I see some hands over there. Uh, there's certainly some hands. Yeah, you have a mic. Go ahead. Stand up, please, so we can see where you are. Yeah. Uh, uh, hello. Hello. So the question was that uh, right now you are researching on radio technology to detect the gas uh, on and also study how galaxies were formed with relation to this gas. So, dark matter is also really... Um, important in how galaxies were formed. So what are the recent advancements in trying to detect dark matter through such telescopes? Okay, yeah. so Jairam, some light on dark matter. <laughs> Great yeah. question, thank you. Yeah, no, it's a good question. Uh, unfortunately, uh, light is in short supply as far as dark matter is concerned. Um, uh, you know, uh, measurements have shown, uh, including uh, particularly measurements using radio telescopes have shown, as you said, that there is dark matter. So for those of you who don't uh, sort of are not familiar with this, I showed you that picture which had a galaxy, which had, was a bit of star in the middle, and then there was all of this gas around it. It turns out that the stars and this gas are actually, you know, trace materials in the galaxy. Much of the galaxy is not, is not in the form of stars. It's not in the form of gas. Much of the mass of the galaxy is in the form of something mysterious, which we don't know what it is, excepting that it's got mass, it has gravity, it's called dark matter. Right, and so that has been known since the uh, 70s and the 80s, um, that there is, uh, if I look at a galaxy, what I'm actually seeing in electromagnetic waves is like the tip of the iceberg. The bulk of the galaxy is actually completely invisible to me. And, um, you know, for various, from various lines of reasoning, people have also uh, established that it cannot be any ordinary kind of matter. It has to be some unusual matter with unusual properties. And so that's generally called dark matter. And you asked me if there are a, what progress there is in detecting dark matter using radio telescopes. So radio telescopes aren't actually, um, you know, radio telescopes are good things for showing you that there must be dark matter because they were, they're able to sort of measure the speed at which things spin. And so therefore they can measure the total mass of things and so on and so forth. I can, they can tell you that there's much more mass than you, than there is in the stars and the gas. And so therefore there must be mass, something invisible over there, which is this dark matter. But detect the dark matter, you need to do a different kind of experiment. You need to do experiments uh, deep underground or something, some place where these, um, as I told you, the dark matter is also like ordinary matter. It's not like protons and neutrons and nuclei. It's some uh, exotic kind of particle. And to detect that particle, you, you either go deep underground where um, you know, all other kinds of ordinary particles are blocked, but you might be able to detect this particle coming through, or you do an experiment in um, in accelerators like CERN and so on and so forth, where you might try and detect some new and unusual particle which has the right properties to be dark matter. So I hope that answered your question. It was a long-winded answer, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, who's got the next one? Maybe, okay, one from this. Okay, the lady out there has hand her, had her hand up for a while. This kid here has a hand up, but give it to, some, give it to one of them. Did somebody ask a question? 
Uh, meanwhile, Jaram, have you told them that people can actually visit this? There's I a big not, science I mailer have, happening. I have not told them. And uh, yes, uh, so I should tell you, uh, there's a science going on right now, even as we speak, right? No, 28. 28. 28. Sorry. Today, this time, it's, it, right now, it's online. On 28, you can actually go there in person um, uh, to Naranga, um, see this telescope, uh, sort of people could tell you how it works and so on and so forth. So please do. Um, uh, information's on our website. Yeah. yeah, if you ever have a chance to visit Narayan Gao and see these telescopes, it's it's just amazing. You should go there. Okay, who's yeah? Go ahead. Uh, so, the, sir, thank you so much for uh, such a wonderful lecture. My question to you is: uh, as you showed us the popular image, which is also known as the pillars of life, the gas one, I just wanted to ask: what are the advantages? which a radio telescope offers over an infrared telescope over like with which that photo was taken. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there are a couple. Um, so um, the, uh, the um, infrared um, uh, telescope obviously will uh, show you things which uh, emit light in the infrared, which is a few degrees uh, Kelvin or so. Um, radio waves, um, uh, uh, but the reason why you go to infrared to start with, is because uh, I told you that in the space between the stars, it's not a vacuum, you see uh, all of these gas clouds and so on and so forth. But it's not just gas, there are also these very fine particulate matter, which is called dust. I mean, it's not the same dust that we see around us today, but it's dust. So you have this very fine particulate matter called dust. And so that dust actually, if you have uh, the, uh, a dusty gas cloud, it actually blocks uh, visible light. So you can't see these things, uh, you know, once you go deep into the cloud, there's so much dust, you can't see into it any, anymore because the optical light has been blocked by the dust. The infrared light actually can penetrate a little further into the dust. So you can see a little deeper into the cloud if you were to use infrared. If you were to use radio waves, you can actually see right through the cloud. They're completely transparent in radio waves, right? Because the radio waves are typically not affected by this dust, by the dust. So you can actually see the whole cloud. Um, uh, I, I didn't get into it, but you can actually also make, um, 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 you know, uh, much of the gas in these clouds uh, is moving. And uh, because and they, it also emits a spectral line and because of Doppler shifts, you are actually able to measure the velocity of the gas. So that's one of the things you can do with radio telescopes. You can see the whole cloud, you can measure the total cloud, you can measure the speeds at which it's moving. And, you know, so it really gives you quite complementary information. Right. So let's move on to the question over there. Yeah. So I wanted to ask that uh, you before you introduced the concept of interferometry, you were saying that the telescope that we need to build if interferometry concept was not there, a large of a size, half of the Maharashtra map. And then you introduced uh, these two telescopes, which can combine the signal, and then we can uh, produce an image. And then you showed this triangular, this three arcs coming from one point. So uh, how does this arc, uh, so uh, I can understand that two telescopes are giving one signal and you're combining them. Then these multiple telescopes, uh, is there a specific arrangement of all these telescopes and how to combine that signal? Yeah. And uh, how does you uh, eliminate the signal of radio waves which are coming from like from the earth and not from the galaxy and also from the galaxy also there are so many stars which might be giving the signal so how that differentiation happens and uh, before you showed the arrangement of that triangle i thought that if we are using multiple telescopes then i would arrange them in a circular form instead of these three arcs so uh, how do we came to that three arc that's arrangement? The first one. <laughs> so that is a large number of that questions. That sounds like an assignment question with part A, B, C, D. We'll try and <laughs> maybe we'll try and answer them. Yeah. So um, yeah, no, I think they're all uh, excellent questions. Um, uh, all of these things matter a lot. Um, so the analogy, um, uh, you know, I said two two telescopes, but I also drew an analogy that we are making a mirror, and we are trying to make a mirror with as few holes as possible. And uh, so the number of holes and the spacing of the holes will depend on where I put my antennas. So the way in which I lay that antenna configuration on the ground will, will sort of have a, a consequence on what kind of mirror I end up making and therefore how good an image I end up making. So that's one part of the answer. Um, 
um, uh, your, your idea that you would have imagined I would put it on the circle is actually uh, a good idea. Um, uh, uh, people started by putting uh, things on a circle, but it turns out it's not actually quite the optimal way of doing things. A spiral uh, turns out to be slightly uh, a better thing to do. Um, and um, and finally, it turns out, you know, despite all of these things that you do, you actually end up with a pretty crap mirror. You know, we put all of these antennas down, but you can easily make out my holes are much, much bigger than the bits where I have mirrors, right? I have a 45 meter diameter dish and the furthest ones are 25 kilometers apart. So I really actually have more hole than mirror, right? So um, it's actually quite difficult to make a good quality image if you're going to start with something that crazy. And so a lot of that work actually gets done using algorithms, software, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of computer processing which goes on, uh, which at the end then gives you the images which I showed you, right? It's not that, uh, you know, that's the thing which comes out of your telescope. You have to do uh, a lot of stuff with the data. And now given that you're doing all of that stuff with the data, it turns out that your sensitivity to where exactly you put these antennas, it matters, but it doesn't matter that much. Right, there is some degrees of freedom. You can play around with it in certain ways and you can get over it with your algorithms and still make a good image. So a lot of what determines where you put the antennas might be cost. I want to put my antennas in such a way that I can have maximum number of antennas because the more antennas I have, the more sensitive I am and so on and so forth. And cost wise, it helps a lot to put things in a straight line because I have to connect everything with wires. If I put them randomly, I have to run a wire to every antenna. I have to dig a trench two meters under the ground because you know we are building this in Kodad, which is a big uh, sugarcane and uh, grape uh, growing area. The farmers will come through with their tractors and uh, do it, uh, you know, sort of uh, plow their land every now and then. You have to bury the thing two meters underground, right? That's very, very expensive. So it's much easier to put the things in a straight line where I will make only one trench and I'll connect all of my antennas in one trench. So it's ideas like this which finally determine uh, where exactly I'll put the antennas. Yeah. Right. Uh, we have time for two short questions at most. Yeah. So there's one, there's one here and there's one there. So yeah. Right. Okay. Short question, short answer. All right. <laughs> right. Yeah, so the question was about uh, the last slide yeah. where you said, you know, we may be running out of gas. Yeah. yeah. So that's because uh, Stars are consuming that gas? Yeah, it's partly because stars are consuming the gas, but actually it turns out that uh, galaxies also are not like, you know, um, closed closed system. It's not that I gave the galaxy at an initial time a certain amount of gas and then that gas, or well, whatever happens, and nothing more, you know, the galaxy doesn't get any more gas. It turns out that as the universe evolves, um, gas also falls into galaxies from the, from the regions around it. So what really seems to be happening is about 10 billion years ago, this process of fresh material raining into the galaxies begins to die out. So the galaxies are unable to continue to get gas at the same rate at which they are forming stars. So the star formation rate can go up again once stars start dying out. Uh, yeah, the answer is no. <laughs> we have tea outside and we can easily, yeah, we can discuss over chat. Yeah, there's a question over there. Yeah. Uh, uh, when I'm offered, uh, you are, uh, I mean, you are also discussing about a black hole. So I wanted to know, this was my uh, curious question, that when a black hole dies, what does it become? Dark matter or what? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you, you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it becomes dark matter. I think uh, black holes do evaporate. They evaporate and form all kinds of other things, but the rate at which they evaporate is very slow. So I think they produce things, but not necessarily dark I'm sorry, matter. So we'll take the last question now and uh, Jairam, will you be available to take questions after yes. the session is over? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. So people, there are questions still. Please catch him outside while you enjoy tea. We'll take the last question from the child in the front. Is there any black hole in Milky Way galaxy? Yes, there are many, many. There's a, there's a very massive one at the center of the galaxy and there are many smaller ones much nearer by. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thanks again, Jairam, for the great talk and uh, thanks for listening, guys. Thank you for coming over. 
and please remember while you leaving to deposit your id cards at the gate at least at the gate or to some volunteer that you see or security that you see we would like to recycle and we would like these back so please keep that in mind before you leave there are also, and also please again i 